Thank you so much for joining us today, Attorney General Wasden. Um, just real quick, right off the bat, how would you describe your relationship with the governor and legislature? Well, it's been a little interesting over the last few weeks, I would say that. A little interesting. Uh, it, it, you know, I'm thinking of Governor Otter's press conference, the post-legislative press conference on Monday, uh, where he was asked about the, the decentralization of your office and the proposals and the discussion surrounding that. And, and he, he said that some of the department heads uh, weren't happy with the services that they were being provided by your office. Um, and, and he brought up the question of where loyalties lie when these deputy attorney generals are assigned. So at the risk of sounding a little McCarthy-esque, where do the loyalties lie when it comes to the Attorney General's office? Well, let me first of all address a little bit of the way the governor presented that matter. He actually said that there were many of his uh, uh, department heads who were happy with the services that we have provided and that uh, there were some who were unhappy. Well, you have to understand that in any kind of lawyerly relationship, you have an obligation to tell some people things they don't want to hear. And if that happens, then they're unhappy. And so you ask the question about the loyalties. Well, the answer is this, that in the public practice of law, that is when you represent a government entity, your duty is different from it is when you are a private lawyer representing a private client. That, and, and even the rules of ethics recognize there's this distinction, this difference that you do. And so I'm elected to represent all of the people of the state. And that's the entity to whom my loyalty flows. And so when I then am assigned to represent a state agency, it's not that agency head that I am representing. It's the agency and on behalf of the people. So your loyalty flows to the rule of law, which is what we should be um, doing. And that is that occasionally I have clients that I have to tell some things they don't want to hear. But that's really the role that an attorney general has. This is an opportunity for the people of the state to say, which kind of which kind of lawyer do we want to have for the people? Do we want to have one who's a cheerleader for, for uh, a state agency or for a legislative body? Or do we want to have an attorney general who is independently elected, constitutional officer, who has the ability to tell people things they don't want to hear, but that they need to know? And that's really, I think, the most basic question we're, we're trying to address right here. But when it comes to the deputy attorney generals mm -hmm. and the department heads and the departments that mm -hmm. work with them, what would be the problem with them being able to choose the attorney that they work with? Well, what happens then uh, on, on occasions is that the attorney, even now, becomes too much associated with the agency. And that interferes with the objectivity that the lawyer has to have to say, well, here's what the law says, and here's my advice to you. And so if you have someone who's willing to you know, compromise on that objectivity, it really doesn't serve the agency, it doesn't serve the agency head, and it doesn't serve the people because that, that advice then is filtered, skewed in a way that tries to accomplish the agency goals. Not that we don't try and accomplish those agency goals, but there's actually two different levels. One is at the advice stage and the other is the advocacy stage. A lot of folks don't recognize that difference. That when I give advice to a client, it needs to be unvarnished. It needs to be straightforward, objective, unpoliticized legal advice. That client then makes decisions about what they're going to do. And then, uh, and then once they make those decisions, my job is to advocate the position that they've taken. That's actually the heart of what's going on here. Because occasionally you'll have clients who don't want to get your advice because they're afraid of what you will say or they don't want to hear what you have to say. And so they simply won't ask you the question. They'll make their decisions. And guess what? Your obligation is still then to help them execute their responsibilities. Now, they brought up one specific point when a deputy attorney general uh, who was working with the Department of Administration on the IEN issue mm -hmm. um, gave them some advice and, and Governor Otter pretty much pinpointed that as part of the reason that the state is in the legal mess as it is. So, so is it really that departments aren't hearing what they want to hear or have there actually been issues with some of the advice that deputy attorney generals have given? Well, in this instance, um, I, I think the governor is sadly misinformed. Um, I've reviewed the affidavit uh, of, or the, the memorandum prepared by Deputy Attorney General Melissa Vandenberg. I've also seen uh, her deposition that was taken in this matter. 
and uh, so you understand what the facts are. We've got to get in the weeds a little bit here. But the fact is that Melissa Vandenberg was not consulted by her client about whether that IEN contract should be split or how it should be split. It wasn't until long after that contract was awarded that she was even contacted and asked to answer a question on an amendment. That is, does this language work? And she did her job and reviewed that language, made suggested changes, technical changes to that language, but it's exactly what I was telling you. They didn't ask the question. They didn't want to hear the answer, so they make their decision, and then the lawyer's job is to help them execute, even though we weren't consulted at the beginning. So did we give bad advice? The answer is no. Now, you say that they didn't consult you, but should your office have been more involved on, in the, in the uh, beginning, knowing that it was such a high-stakes contract? Well, I would certainly have said that the Department of Administration should have included my office in that discussion, absolutely, but they chose not to, which is their choice. They, they can choose not to talk to us, and that's what they chose. And the, so the answer here is, did we give bad advice? The answer is no. Had we been asked the question, can they split this contract, the answer would be yes. Because the statute specifically says that it can be split, but it also has elements that they have that the department has to meet in order to make that split. They didn't meet those requirements. By the way, this memorandum written by Melissa Vandenberg was written six months after that contract was awarded, because that's when she, she was asked to review it. So, I mean, uh, again, sadly misinformed in terms of the allegations being made here. And uh, the, the memorandum does not sustain the claims that the governor issued at that press conference. Now, I'm, I'm noticing a, a running theme in a lot of the conflicts between your office and the executive branch, the legislative branch, whoever. Um, and that theme seems to be communication. Mm -hmm. They didn't ask. Nobody talked to me about this. If they had a problem with it, we're hearing about it through the press. Correct. But communication is a two-way street. And so when you look at that dynamic specifically, which is, a, which is a, a common theme in a lot of these conflicts, what would you do differently? Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of p political theatrics here, a uh, little bit of political ambush. Uh, when you have a weak case, that's one of the tactics that you use, and so I'm just going to throw that out there, as, you know, <laughs> in the whole discussion. Uh, but I think that uh, you know, that that people ought to sit down and actually have conversations. Again, when you don't want to hear what you know is going to be said, so you just simply avoid the contact, avoid the discussion. I don't think that serves the people well. Um, and so what we have tried to do, what I've asked all of my uh, deputies to do, is give accurate, fair, objective, timely legal advice. So it's really incumbent upon my clients as they make decisions. We don't run their business. We don't usurp their authority to make decisions. They really need to ask us, you know, what's the law on this? That's not the first time that's ever happened. I, I mean, there's been a couple of instances, uh, well, many instances, when they just simply don't want to hear what we have to say. Uh, one, one pretty pretty interesting one was uh, during a uh, State of the State address when there was a pronouncement about what the policy was going to be, it happened to be contrary to the law. So then they came running to me and said, hey, well, what is it going to take to get you on board with this? Well, the answer is you got to comply with the law. And that doesn't change in the context of those relationships or any, any of those other things. I mean, they have an obligation to comply with the law. My job, what I'm elected to do is say, here's the law. So wh where do you think these tensions started? Because there's been a lot of talk about this, especially publicly, in the last year and a half. And I'm thinking Idaho National Lab. I'm thinking IEN. I'm, I'm thinking of many, many things. Um, but that wasn't the beginning of this. Was it, no. was it the tri tribal gaming uh, issue? Was it Brent Coles? Was it, it something else? It was, it was tribal gaming. It actually uh, was the very first few days I was in office. The entire Senate and House leadership came to my office. Uh, they welcomed me as the new, newly elected Attorney General, and then they asked me to sue the state. Uh, my client, by the way, they asked me to sue the state to challenge the Indian Gaming Initiative. Now, think of that for a moment or two. That would have been entitled uh, the State of Idaho by and through Attorney General Lawrence Wasden versus the State of Idaho by and through Attorney General Lawrence Wasden. I told them my obligation is no different from a, a, an initiative passed by the citizens than it is to defend a statute passed by the legislature. And the question then is, 
Um, well, who defends the Constitution? Well, my job is to, as the law says, presume that that statute is constitutional, that that initiative is constitutional. I argue that that statute or initiative is consistent with the Constitution, that they are in line. That's my defense of the Constitution. Um, and so it doesn't matter whether I agree or disagree with what that policy choice is, it is my job to present the legal arguments in defense of that. It doesn't even matter, matter whether I think I'm going to win or lose. That's still my obligation to present those legal arguments. Um, and so in that process, there's the, part of the confrontation occurred in this way. And that is I informed the legislature pretty specifically that they, they were in a unique position. That if they didn't like the Indian Gaming Initiative, they had the, the ability, power, and in fact under the Constitution, the duty to repeal the Indian Gaming Initiative. But that wasn't politically palatable to them. Now, I also said you have the ability to select your own outside counsel. Without my office's involvement, that wasn't politically palatable. I also said you can ask me for the appointment of a special deputy attorney general to represent your views, and I'm, I'm bound by the law to, to appoint one. I stand ready to do so. And they said that's not politically palatable to them. So the very people who in a very unique situation have the ability to actually repeal the Indian Gaming Initiative didn't do it. So I did my job. I fulfilled my obligation to the people of this state defending the policy choice that they had made. But when, when you look back at that argument, you know, you, you discussed the, the, or didn't discuss really, the constitutionality of uh, the Indian gaming machines, the slot machines mm -hmm. on tribal land, which are prohibited in Idaho's constitution. Correct. And that kind of set up this dynamic with what we've seen with the historic horse racing uh, issue. I mean, the, that the, the court said that this has already been ruled on. So when you look back at that, would you have done that differently? knowing what you know now in hindsight? No, because my duty was to defend the policy choice made by the people. You understand what I'm saying by that. The people have the power to, to make the law. My job is to defend the law. I actually stand on the State House steps and take an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Idaho, and the laws of the State of Idaho. That's my obligation. And because the, whether it's a statute or an initiative, it is, it is the policy choice of the people. My job is to defend that. Let me give you a couple of good examples. One of those is that uh, the Citizens by Initiative, um, they um, passed uh, term limits. The legislature actually sued to have term limits declared unconstitutional. My job was to defend the constitutionality of term limits. So, and we did that successfully. But when term limits began to be effective, and it was very broad and it involved the legislature, they then passed the statute to repeal term limits. That was vetoed by the governor, the veto was overridden, and then that repeal of term limits was then attacked as being unconstitutional. My job was to defend now the new law, which was uh, the repeal of term limits, and we successfully defended the repeal of term limits. That was then subjected to a citizen's referendum, which the citizens sustained the repeal of term limits. So, I mean, it's not that the legislature didn't know they had the power to countermand the Indian Gaming Initiative. They just chose not to do it. They had the duty to defend the temperance and morality of the people, and, you know, they chose to, 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 to let the, the Indian Gaming Initiative lie. Now, was, did I fulfill my responsibility? Absolutely. I did everything that I am required and expected to do under the law. In fact, as I mentioned, the law says that I am to uh, presume that a statute or an initiative is constitutional. That's the duty that I have. And I defend, again, them both, the statute and the, the Constitution, to say that they are in line. Uh, the the, uh, the same-sex marriage matters, uh, e another example of, the, of that, that same principle, and that is it doesn't matter whether I agree or disagree with what the people of the state chose as the policy embodied in the Constitution about marriage between a man and a woman. What, it doesn't matter whether I think I'm going to win or going to lose or I'm the wrong side or the right side of history. doesn't matter. What matters is my obligation is to present the legal arguments in defense of that policy choice by the people. But, but you've said before that you knew that that wouldn't hold up in court. And so I, if, if I'm a viewer listening at home mm -hmm. and you say, I have to assume that a statute is constitutional and defend it based on that, even if... I know that it's not constitutional, even if I know that it will lose in court. 
for a viewer watching at home or f even for a lawmaker who works with you, how is that not a waste of time and resources? Because I'm not the one that makes the policy choice. It's either the legislature or the people. And, and, the, and the, there's, a, there's a kind of a subtle difference, and that is I don't know what the court's going to say. The question is, can I present a legal argument to defend that policy? And I don't actually know what the court is going to say. There are some occasions in which we do know what the court is, say, is going to say. In fact, one, one of those cases was uh, out of the uh, Pocatello, Pocatello Education Association case. That was a statute uh, essentially, you know, fostered by Senator, uh, uh, by, um, by the Senator from Idaho Falls. Uh, in which uh, there was a Ninth Circuit case directly on point that said the legislature doesn't have the power to inhibit uh, a uh, union, to prevent a union from using its money for, public, for political purposes. There was a Ninth Circuit case directly on point, and yet that's what the statute said. We'd advise the legislature that there's going to be constitutional infirmity here. They passed it anyway, so what's my obligation? My obligation is to defend as much of that as I can, but I actually had to end up stipulating that that portion of the statute was unconstitutional. The rest of that statute, I took all the way to the United States Supreme Court, defended, and won. So that sort of outlines what my obligation is. Now it sounds like a lot of your frustration lies with the legislature and what they do. Now one of the ongoing conversations we've had on this show is uh, how much power the legislature has and how that they've been uh, doing things to kind of consolidate more power at the state legislative level. And I'm curious about your take on that, especially you know thinking about things like the Legislative Legal Fund and the Constitutional Defense Fund. Well, a couple of things I would I would say about that. First of all, on the issue of uh, frustration, I don't in any way attempt to usurp the authority of the legislature to make policy choices. My job is to advise them of whether we think that's going to pass constitutional muster or not. They then pass some legislation. I defend it, and oftentimes um, we lose. Uh, not because uh, of bad lawyering, but because the case itself, uh, you know, the precursors to the case, the, 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 the issue, uh, cases issued by the United States Supreme Court, for example, on, on abortion, tell us what the law is. It's not a function of whether I believe or don't believe, it is that's the law. And so we end up then paying attorney fees and we lose those cases. It's not because uh, uh, of a bad presentation, it's because you got a loser case because they didn't want to accept the advice for political reasons or whatever other reasons they may may view. Now you talk about the expansion of or the attempted expansion of uh, of legislative power. You think of this for a moment. Uh, in uh, two years ago, the legislature proffered an amendment to encapsulate in the Constitution its power to declare rules void. That's a unique power among any of the states, um, the citizens of this state rejected that constitutional amendment. Now, two years later, we're back in play and the legislature passed that constitutional amendment again to present to the voters in November. That is really, um, you know, an expansion. Uh, it's an attempt, it's a power grab by the legislature, which seems to be um, in, in, the, in that mode right now. And, uh, that actually then brings into, into, to me into conflict with them, not, not just in that power grab, but in a variety of ways. When I end up being the check, saying, no, the law actually says that you have a duty to go claw back money. I have an obligation to say that to them. Um, they don't like that. Uh, they're mad about that. Uh, but am I the one creating the conflict, or am I the one who has been willing to stand up, be the check, uh, in a system of checks and balances and to properly articulate the law, which is my duty, which is what I was elected to do. And so does that produce some conflict? Yeah, sometimes it does. I wish it didn't. I wish that, you know, that you could sit down and have a conversation with people. Uh, I don't think it's really good practice to do things like, you know, hold your budget hostage or to uh, present uh, petitions or, or resolutions in House committees uh, that are, you print them without ever having talked to me and let me know, you name me personally, you don't end up uh, even holding a hearing so that members of the body can even get a, any a, a additional information. Those are the tactics wh which are employed, basically uh, political machinations, uh, you know, um, that sort of thing. I don't think that's really conducive to good public dialogue, but those are the tactics they, they use and choose. 
Now you mentioned checks and balances, but isn't this a form of checks and balances against your office from the legislative level? Well, um, that's certainly an, an issue that you have to decide, and I think that the people of the state have to decide again which kind of uh, which kind of uh, operation do you want? Do you want to have people who are cheerleaders for for uh, uh, agency heads? Do you want to have people that are cheerleaders for you know every uh, political notion that comes along, or do you want to have an attorney general who is willing to stand up and say, no, this is the law. You can you can still make the choice. You can you can uh, ignore my advice if you if you choose to do so. But this is the law, and I guess we really have to decide which of those we want to pursue. It it sounds like, yeah, and, and forgive me if I'm interpreting this wrong, but it sounds like you feel like you're the one taking the job of checks and balances seriously. Um, I'm not going to say that I'm the only thing or only one. Uh, I think our system of government, our constitutional system, has three coordinate, co-equal branches of government. Judicial, legislative, and executive. I am an executive officer. And, and our constitution in that context creates uh, checks and balances among those various uh, branches of government. And I believe that I have that obligation, a constitutional obligation, to do exactly what I'm saying. That is, I do end up being a check. I don't control my, my client agency's decisions. That's because then I would usurp their authority. I would be the king. That's not what my responsibility is. But my responsibility is to be their conscience of the law, of the rule of law, and say, this is the law. I will fulfill my obligation. I'm asking you to fulfill your obligation, but you get to choose whether you're going to do that or whether you're not. And that's the same process that I have employed across the board. Do you feel like the judicial branch is holding up its end of the checks and balances system? Well, I certainly think that, uh, you know, you read some of the recent cases and, and the answer would be yes. Uh, do I think that they're entirely perfect? No. I mean, I disagree with them because I make arguments in front of them all the time and they sometimes they say I'm wrong. So yes. I don't always agree with them. <laughs> you know, I, I, speaking of that, I, I, I'm thinking of um, the, the ruling on IEN mm -hmm. and, and talking about the issue of, of clawbacks mm -hmm. and how to avoid ending up in court again. Now, the, the legislature, the, the speaker and the pro tem set aside that $8 million for a potential settlement. Um, what are the implications if they do settle? Well, there's actually two elements here that I think we need to talk about. First of all, is it illegal for the uh, legislature to appropriate $8 million and put, park that in that fund? And the answer is, is it? No, absolutely not. Because the legislature has plenary power in this arena. They are the entity who has the power to appropriate money. So there's nothing inappropriate about that. The question then comes, what about the execution of that? The, payment of that money and the process that going forward. Our Supreme Court has spoken pretty loudly, pretty clearly uh, on its view as to what advance payments means. It very clearly, by the way, and this kind of picks back up on the Melissa Vandenberg issue, uh, very clearly the court said um, after having reviewed all the affidavits, all of the testimony, all the depositions, twice the court has said we know where the responsibility for this debacle lies and it lies at the feet of the governor's office and the department of administration and I'm, those aren't my words those are the words of the court who said that they had corrupted the the contracting process that's the words of the court not me that's the words of the court and as a consequence i didn't create th this situation the court was fully aware of the advice that we had given, the deposition taken by Melissa Vandenberg, and the court now has made its decision about where that responsibility lies. Part of leadership is taking responsibility for your actions, and I, I accept the responsibility for the actions by, by my deputy, uh, uh, Vandenberg. She did exactly what she was supposed to do. Now, when we... We're almost out of time, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very curious, when we look at these tensions, not just with the governor's office, but with lawmakers and, and, uh, and multiple lawmakers on both sides of the rotunda, how are these tensions affecting the people of Idaho when it comes down to it? Well, and that's a very good question. There's a couple of things. You know, I could simply capitulate uh, to, to make 
legislators happy, but does that serve the interest of the, of the public? Does that really serve their interest? If I'm willing to say, go ahead, ignore the law, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't serve the public's interest. What serves the public, in, public interest and the citizens of this state is if I'm willing to say, no, this is the law, I'm willing to fulfill my duty no matter what the political consequences are. Uh, part of what needs to happen here is folks do need to sit down and have a conversation, a serious conversation, not just about what policy do I want to affect, but what's the proper constitutional process, the legal mechanism for me to accomplish what I want to do. Now, looking forward, uh, you still have to work with the governor, you still have to work with the lawmakers, and we just had a 20-minute discussion about all of your frustrations with them and their frustrations with you. Is it possible to repair these relationships for the next two, three years? Well, I guess we'll have to see. Uh, I certainly think it's possible, but part of what has to happen is you have to have people willing to sit down and have a conversation. It doesn't come in the context of a political ambush at a press conference. It doesn't come in the context of a political ambush in a legislative hearing that's a greased bill that you're not even going to have a hearing on. You're going to send it to the, directly to the floor. It doesn't come in the context of uh, holding a budget hostage without ever calling and saying, hey, I'm upset with you. I mean, you know, ad adults sit down and have a conversation when they have that sort of a disagreement. And, and they have it in a, in a, I will say, congenial way. It doesn't mean that everything has to be pleasant and you have to be buddy-buddy and want to go out and, you know, have, a, a, have a, a, an ice cream after, after your conversation. But the answer is that we have to sit down and actually have a conversation. That would serve the interests of the people here. I stand ready to have that conversation. In fact, you and I uh, happened to see each other in a rotunda the other day and sat down and just had a conversation. Uh, I'm really not that hard to contact. <laughs> Folks know where I am. Now that said, we, we've had this conversation on set. Have you had these conversations with Jeff Thompson, with Bart Davis, with Governor Otter? Everything you told me today, have you told them? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, they haven't bothered to call. Have you uh, called them? Well, you know, when they, uh, they take the action that they do, it's probably better to let them uh, sort of simmer down a little bit uh, than it is to confront them immediately. That's probably not a good form and not conducive to a, to a, a good conversation. Uh, you know, I'd had com I've had conversations, a variety of conversations with, uh, with Senator Davis. In fact, I will tell you about a conversation I had with him on this very point on deconsolidation. And he said, Lawrence, that's not going to happen. I would, I would call you before that ever happened. But then the next thing, about several weeks later, he holds my budget. And on one of the bases is deconsolidation and INL. Now, did I have a conversation with him? I tried to have a conversation with him, but, but he, didn't, he didn't bother. With Jeff Thompson, uh, I don't know what they're going to introduce into a committee. I can't I can't preemptively have a conversation with him unless he's willing to call me and talk with me about about that uh, that that uh, that that bill that he was proffering. I, I don't know what he's going to proffer. What I mean, tomorrow he may proffer. I mean, next year he may proffer something else. How do I know what it's going to be? It's really incumbent upon them under those circumstances to. Uh, to come and talk with me. I mean, another incident that happened with, uh, with uh, uh, Representative Vanderwout. I mean, he, he presents a constitutional amendment to remove me from the land board, never bothered to, to talk to me. I mean, the members of the committee who uh, allowed that to be printed asked him whether he talked to me. He said no. I mean, it's that, that, style, that tactic of the political ambush um, isn't really conducive to good, healthy, even debate or disagreement. Uh, it doesn't foster that kind of communication. Now, when you're looking forward and thinking about the future of your own career, wherever that might take you, do these fights make you reconsider what you want to do next? Well, you, you have to say, you know, um, what's this all about and where are we going and how do we get here and all that's an important self-analyzing sort of thing. But the answer is, is really, I have a constitutional duty and I'm willing to fulfill that constitutional duty. That's what the citizens of this state expect from me. That's what they elected me for. It's what I stood on the State House steps and I took an oath to do, and I'm gonna fulfill that. All right, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And thank you for watching. To see our full interview, go to idahoreports.blogs.idahoptv.org. We'll see you next week.